Josh Kroenke says football now instead of soccer. That's a good start. Let's talk about this interview. Welcome to Chino's Arsenal. Let's do it. Hey guys, welcome to Shino's Arsenal. My name is Jessica. I'm your host. You can follow me on Twitter at Justino Tweets and at Shino's Arsenal. Welcome. So on today's show, we're going to be talking about the interview that Josh Kroenke did with one of the Blue Wire podcasts. I can't remember what it was called. It's called like Road Tripping or something like that. And he talks about the Super League and his ideas for Arsenal and kind of how the full ownership um, that KSE now has with Arsenal, how that kind of came about. And it's an interesting time for him to do this interview, which I'm sure it's 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 all because of the Super Bowl and all of that. But it's interesting timing because any time that the Rams are doing well or another one of the Cronkies sports teams are doing well, the Arsenal fan base starts to have um, something to say about it. And, you know, I can't really blame the fan base for feeling almost like the ugly stepchild when it comes to being one of KSE's assets because over the years it's felt like Arsenal has been somewhat of an afterthought and it feels as though now since they've had full ownership and Josh Kroenke has become a lot more invested in in Arsenal that we're seeing a little bit more we're getting more attention you know at least from Josh Kroenke we know Stan doesn't he doesn't care about Arsenal. His baby is the Rams. And thus you've kind of seen like the investment that's gone into the Rams. And so Josh is taking more of a leadership role in terms of Arsenal. And ever since he's been doing that, we've been seeing a little bit more attention. But since the Rams have won the Super Bowl and Josh Kroenke has kind of come out with this interview, I've seen a lot of discourse on on Twitter surrounding whether or not Josh Kroenke or the Kroenke's KSC, whatever, deserve some sort of clean slate, if we've gotten it all wrong, if they're actually good owners, are we any different than Manchester United and other teams in, in the league that have American owners? And it's caused a split in the fan base. And it's a very touchy conversation to have because a lot of people in this fan base just hate the Kroenke's whether the information is there or not, whether they should or should not be held accountable for certain things, it feels like there's an overwhelming hate for the Cronkies, which I understand, but I also like to have the facts. There are a lot of, you know, fans in the fan base that feel like we've never spent money. You know, they're tight. Stan Cronky is cheap. Da, da, da. Well, the reality is, is that he's ne- they've never really had to take money out of their own pocket. And to be quite honest, that's n- not really how it always works. Owners don't always just take money just like out of their pocket and and put it into the club. It doesn't always work like that. And so basically what the Crunkies can do is allow money to be taken out of the club. And that's kind of what's been happening. And that's how we've seen the big transfer windows, at least over the last three transfer windows. We've had pretty big transfer windows. So the idea that we haven't spent money is kind of a farce, you know? And so when I hear people say, well, we don't ever spend money. We're always the team that doesn't have the money. That's not necessarily true. Um, especially since they've had 100% ownership since 2018. What I will say though, is the super league was a big, um, decision that KSC made that, what if there was any trust there with the fan base, they lost a lot of it during that. And it's going to take time for them to repair the, I guess, um, reputation that they have with a large part of the fan base is just being Americans that don't give a shit about Arsenal football club. And it's, it's just, I think it's, you want to have the facts and make sure that the reason why you don't like the Cronkies is an actual reason to not like them. But let's be let's keep it 100. We are far, far, far away from, in my opinion, saying that the Cronkies have turned a corner. We have good owners and stuff like that. But there are some signs there that is 
at least with Josh Kroenke involved, that we're trying to do the right things, whether or not those things will bear fruit. We don't know just yet, but we are seeing signs and there's nothing wrong with acknowledging that you're seeing signs, but you also don't have to go as far to say that they are good owners. And that's kind of the gray area that we're going to be talking, talking about. So make sure you guys like the video, subscribe to the channel. I want to start off with him kind of talking about placing the importance and placing importance on the culture you know, placing importance on the culture. We have kind of over the last couple of years have heard from, you know, Arteta, Adu, uh, Vinai over the last couple of years talking a lot about regaining that culture and rebuilding the club and stuff like that. And a lot of times these are kind of just buzzwords. You know, it feels like buzzwords, um, culture, um, rebuild, uh, process, um, project, you know, things like that. But Josh placed a huge, like he, he, he made sure that he talked about wanting to rebuild the culture, the winning culture at Arsenal. And Arteta is a big part of that. And we've always kind of known that there was a special relationship between Arteta and Josh Kroenke. And the Kroenkes do tend to like younger coaches, um, coaches that are a little bit more green. And I think what they, what Josh Kroenke likes about Arteta is that he, because he played for the club, he somewhat understands what the Arsenal culture is. Now you could say that like Arteta wasn't at Arsenal during the time where I think most of us would say that the culture was, was really doing its thing. Like he definitely wasn't a part of the invincibles. He definitely wasn't, you know, our, in my memory, because I'm, I'm 33 years old, so bear with me, but in my memory, the culture really kind of stopped being the culture in like 2010. And we became like a club that liked to sell our best players. We never really invested. We kind of went through this lull all the way up until when Arsene Wenger kind of left, you know, so Arteta came in at in like 2011. And so he may understand the culture to a certain extent, but he wasn't necessarily a part of it, in my opinion. But in terms of what Josh sees, he thinks that Arteta understands the culture that they are trying to rebuild and, and grow, right? So he placed a lot of importance on that. And then he also placed importance on building an elite environment. And we know that Arteta has spoken about that before. Josh Kroenke mentioned that Arteta has been a part of an elite environment at Manchester City, play, um, coaching under Pep Guardiola. So our suspicions are, are right that a lot of what I think has made Arteta a standout candidate for the Cronkies in terms of being a manager for Arsenal Football Club is him being a past player, but also understanding what an elite environment is because he coached at Man City. Now, does that make him the right man and, you know, uh, a great coach and all of that? He didn't really speak on that part. And we'll only know if Arteta is going to be a great coach until he kind of takes us, you know, um, a little bit further. But the cultural aspect of understanding what Arsenal is and what Arsenal needs to be in the future, as well as being a part of an elite level environment and hopefully being able to Re build that into the the new arsenal is something that he placed a lot of importance on and um we've kind of seen that arteta has placed his like little touches of trying to build an elite level environment within the club like having the arson banger picture up where they high five it and you know the the little words all throughout the the london colony that says like unity and stuff like that and also rebuilding the locker room and stuff like that. So we've seen that from like a, almost like a facade aspect of it, but also being very, very um, unwavering when it comes to removing characters within the dressing room that don't go with an elite environment. So we've kind of seen that with when Doozy, with Ozo, with Aubameyang. And so we see it on both fronts. We see it in terms of the training facilities, London Colony, making sure there are sprinkles of, you know, um, things that remind us of where we came from, 
and then also in what Arteta is doing in terms of dealing with the playing squad. And so, yeah, I mean, that that definitely stood out to me as the culture and the elite environment are things that are really important and which ultimately have led to Josh Kroenke putting a lot of trust in Arteta because he feels like he understands those things. Now it's up to you and whether you think that he embodies those things, but that's what Josh Kroenke was kind of saying. He also kind of, he spoke about the pandemic being a really big challenge. I think also we have to remember that, you know, the Kroenke's took over a hundred percent ownership in like 2018 and then the pandemic hit in 2019. So they had, what he said is that they had big plans and a lot of that kind of got um, lost because of the pandemic. Now we still invested in the midst of a pandemic, we still bought Gabrielle and we still um, bought Thomas Party, but we know that we didn't really get the job done as best as we could. And with the amount of players that we're getting rid of now, you can kind of see that that process was really slowed down. The ability to move on dead wood was a big part of the rebuild that didn't get done during that time. I remember sitting there during that window and everybody was on the chopping block. Like literally everybody was on the transfer list and nobody left because nobody could buy players and our players are on huge wages. And even now coming out of the pandemic, we still are in it, but coming out of the pandemic, we still see how hard it is to move on our players. So he spoke about the pandemic being a challenge and also, you know, Arteta kind of being the start of the Premier League kind of postponing. Because we remember, like, Arteta was, like, the first, like, face of somebody who got COVID. And he got it right before we were supposed to play Man City. And the league shut down. Also, he spoke about, you know, shaking the hand of the the coach of Olympiacos and then learning later on that he had COVID and, and all of that. So going back in time and kind of thinking about the pandemic and how difficult it was for Arsenal to start the rebuild that we see us doing now in that time, we kind of lost a year of being able to do that, but they were always kind of invested in turning over the squad. And now we're seeing that, but the pandemic put a huge dent in those plans. And that was, that was an interesting um, point that, that he made. Um, He also kind of talked about how the Emirates holding like 60,000 people and not being able to get that income in really like, hurt the business badly and um it also hurt us because during that time like we know that football is nothing without fans and we don't ever want to go back into those times and yeah on both sides the business side and on the footballing side the pandemic really messed a lot of stuff up and um hearing it from his from his mouth was was interesting as well let's see um what you guys are saying in the chat um as far afsar says let's not make excuses for the cronkies i don't think anybody's making excuses for them um don one says cronky war with uzmanov over ownership costs arsenal 13 years that we will never get back yes um let's see um craig malloy says arsenal have spent over 600 million over the past six years i mean that's the thing is like if you're upset that the owners are american and you have um a like if we had an owner that wasn't american and understood the game more we would be in a better position fine you know i could kind of understand that but we like we never spend money is kind of not a good argument for why you don't like the cronkies and i like to be more specific so we didn't invest as much in the in-between years of like them getting those initial shares and them becoming 100% owners in 2018. And when you think about business from the business side of it, and here's the thing, you guys, is that Arsenal is a business, like from the Kroenke standpoint, you know, especially because football is not their number one priority. Like Stan absolutely loves American football. So for him, it's important for the Rams to be, really competitive and win things. 
But in terms of them getting involved in Arsenal, it was always an asset, an investment. And so they're going to mostly think about things from the foot, um, from a business standpoint, at least before 2018. That's what was really happening. And when you don't have sole ownership of something, you're not going to put as much investment in it. So we did spend um, a a long time not really investing like pretty much since the moment we moved to the emirates we stopped really investing in the team the way that i feel like we should have especially with teams like chelsea and man city really coming to the forefront and spending big money we just didn't do that we would sell our players and then we wouldn't see any of the money like being spent on players and so i get that but over the past like four years and i have the the players here that we bought we have spent money so for me, that's not really a valid thing. And if you just don't like them because they're American, fine, you know, but the not spending money thing doesn't really hold weight in my opinion. Um, let's see. Shane Lowe says, what's the definition of a good owner? Maybe we should start there and then we can make an assessment. Yeah. I mean, it depends. Like some people, a good owner is somebody like Abramovich who really cares about winning and is willing to spend whatever it takes to get your team to that to that point. Um, some people feel like being in a good financial situation. If you've ever followed what happened with um, Borussia Dortmund over the years, um, they went through a financial tragedy and they rebuilt the club in a way that it was a self-sustaining model where they can buy and sell players and keep the books good. And that is their version of a of good ownership and and not ever being in a position where they think they have to close the club down because they got they went into a period of time where they didn't know if the club would actually be able to to continue on. And so we all have different definitions of what a good owner is. And for me, it's a combination of the two. I like long term sustainability, like a plan that would allow for us to be successful relatively successful all the time like i don't really like the we get to the tippy top and then we go down tippy top and then go down somewhat of like what chelsea does like when they hire hire and fire managers they tend to do a lot of this and they do get to the tippy top but they will go down sometimes as well that's not really what i i would view as good ownership i know that it's like well he's throwing money at it so that looks like good ownership but for me it's something that's sustainable over a long period of time i personally like the club to spend money but smartly and for us to always be in a good financial situation like the financial situation that arsenal have been in especially before the Cronkies become became 100% owners, I did not like. I did not like that we could not spend money. Um, a lot of that had to do with us going to the Emirates and having to pay off the loan and all that kind of stuff. But I like to feel like the lights are always going to be on, that we have a long-term vision for sustainable success. And I don't care if they give a shit about our like football. Like I actually don't care. Like if they want to come to games and they're always visible and all, I don't, that's not really what I think a good owner is like. And also good owners for me, if you're not going to care about the football, and this is where I think that Kroenke got it wrong for several years is if you're going to be absent, make sure you have the right people in place to, to make sure that you're still successful. And I think that's where they really failed for me, not with, you know, spending money, but with hiring the likes of Raul, I think Azidis, keeping Arsene Wenger too long, hiring Unai Emery, those things are kind of where I feel like they lost me. If you're going to be an absentee owner, you need to have the right people in charge to run the club. And so for me, a, the definition of a good owner is somebody that can hire well, long-term sustainable plan to stay successful for, in, for me, successful means at least in the top four, you know, like a sustainable plan to keep us in the top four all the time and then be able to invest enough when we need to, to try to push for the title. Um, I don't like this, you know, winning, winning the league and then going down, winning the league, going down, firing, hiring managers. I'm not really into that, but it depends on 
what you think. But for me, a good owner doesn't have to really care about football. They have to care about their business being successful. And a part of a football team being successful is not just about balancing the books. It's about being competitive as well. So that's that's kind of for me, that's that's just what it is. Uh, CAG2203 says, compared to with other teams in the big six, let's say the last 10 years, we were spending peanuts. I don't think so. I think we're right up there with everybody else um, in terms of spending money. The big six are us, Spurs, Manchester United, Man City, Chelsea, and Liverpool. Um, we all spend pretty much the same amount of money. Um, the thing about City is that we'll never be able to spend that amount. They, The owners that they have have way more money than the Cronkies. Um, and I think there is a difference between having American ownership and other ownership in that regard, because American ownership always is going to kind of have a little bit of restraint to it, where if you have an Abramovich or you have a shake, it's going to be a little bit different. But saying that we spent peanuts when we are spending lots of money and we're spending it at almost like the same frequency as other teams I, I think that's a little bit like, nah, like we are spending a lot of money. We spend it stupidly. That's really the rea The reality is we spend money, but we spend it stupidly. And that comes from the Cronkies not having the right people in place to run the club because they're absentee. They don't know who the right players are. They literally hired Raul because he worked for Nike and worked for Barcelona. And in the Cronkies mind, that's successful. You know, we have somebody in our ranks that worked for Nike and Barcelona, but not really looking at his background. And that's more of the issue. We have spent money. The we haven't spent money thing is is we've spent it poorly, you know. Yo Yo says KSC appointed Arteta Edu Per. All Wenger players. Josh has to go further with required servants. Has to go further with required mm -hmm. servants at board level. Well, here's here's the thing, Yo Yo, is that I do feel similarly to you, where I think that his knowledge of what um, of who should be running Arsenal is kind of um, shallow. You know, it's it's quite shallow. So it's like, okay, well, who knows Arsenal? It's people that have played at Arsenal under Wenger, they've been here for a long period of time. I'm just going to go after them. I think that's a start. That's better than Raul and Ivan Gazidis, people we don't know anything about. But there does have to be a shift into – bringing people on that don't necessarily have a connection with Arsenal, but are much better at their job. Um, and I think that that for me actually applies more to Adu than it does to Arteta. In my opinion, I think that there are much better technical directors out there, directors of football that we could be taking advantage of, but for Josh Kroenke, because his knowledge is so shallow, he doesn't have much, beyond you know arsenal and who's been here he's kind of relying upon people that he feels like he can trust and right now the people that he can trust are kind of the people that have been here before and so i do i do understand that and um he does have to go outside like if we want to progress i don't think adu can take us to where we want to be and arteta is kind of in that camp as well i'm not sure if he could take us to where we want to be can't just the next person we hire after Arteta, the first person on the list cannot be Vieira, can it? It needs to be something else, right? Um, Terrence Tibbs says Kroenke's biggest fault is trusting Wenger for so long. I do think that that is a, and that's the thing is like they want to place trust in people because they don't know. Um, and when you do that, and you also don't know what's bad, so you don't know what's good and you don't know what's bad, and you're trusting in people, you can't see the signs like. Raul was such a horrible appointment. Ivan Gazidis was not a great appointment. And Arsene Wenger for so long was an appointment. But you can tell that they want to place a lot of trust in people because they don't know. And that also creates an environment where you could be taken advantage of. And Josh Kroenke needs to be a lot more vigilant in, in what he's doing and making sure he understands what's good and what's bad so he can understand when it's time to move on from people or not. And hopefully um, that Tim Lewis guy is somebody that they can have on the Cronky side that can see at least financially what's what's working and what's not, because a lot of times that can tell you if you're going in the right direction or not. But on the football side, I'm not sure that 
there's somebody there that would say Arteta needs to go that Josh Kroenke would believe, um, if that makes sense. I think Arteta can tell him when somebody needs to go, but I don't think that there's somebody there on the footballing side that can say Arteta has to go, let's move on, that he trusts. And that's where the checks and balances are not really there for me. Um, and that's why you have the Cronkies kind of trusting in all these people because they don't know what's good and bad. And that's the, that is the, the con of having an American ownership where they don't really understand the game they have to hire well and they have to have a barrier between the people that they've hired and they have to have somebody that they trust that can have checks and balances right now. I feel like Arteta might be a little bit too close to Kroenke and that um, that's an issue. So let's see. Um, Terrence Tibbs says Dinesh. Oh no, you guys talking to each other. And so, yeah, I mean, here's, here's the reality you guys is that, I, I'm always going to come from a place of under, I want to understand first. And if in this first 25 minutes of me speaking, you think that I'm backing the Cronkies, saying that the Cronkies are good owners, um, saying that they're not bad, whatever, then you've missed the entire point and you weren't listening. If you want me to just say cronky out, cronky shit, cronky is a go leave. Because what I'm, but when we, when I started the conversation, I said that you can see signs of Josh Cronky wanting to do the right things, but that also doesn't mean that we can put a stamp of approval on him and the Cronkies being good owners. But what we're talking about here is the gray area in between like, in talking about where we are right now. And so I, I'm never going to come from a, their shit, get them out, da, 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 because I don't know if you guys realize this, but we're not getting rid of Josh and, and Stan Kroenke. Those are our owners. Like, that's it. So unless you guys want to protest and stop going to games and stop buying stuff and really hurt their pocket, these are the conversations that we're going to have because these are going to be our owners. So if you got... I'm backing the Cronkies from the first 30 minutes is because all you want to hear is Cronky out. That's it. And we're having a more in-depth conversation about what he said in that interview and acknowledging what's actually ha happened since 2018, because I do think it's interesting to see how he's trying to implement an American, a North American st structure into a European football club and if we think that's going to work out or not. You know, I think that's a more interesting conversation than cronky out, cronky out, cronky out. Like that's boring, you know, so we're not having that conversation. Uh, the truth says free. Thank you so much for your super chat. It says all great points. Great show. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. So let's just, let's keep the conversation going, but yeah, I'm, I can't do the, Crunky out, crunky out, crunky out. Because, I mean, we all know that we would prefer different owners. But I think it's also important. Somebody else said this, that we have to, what is a good owner? You know, what is a good owner to you guys? Yo-Yo says, Ajax have always been the template. Josh started well in theory by bringing in Vanger players like Arteta per Adu, But he must go further with board members like David O'Leary. And see, that was, that that's important as well. Like, when David O'Leary wanted to be a part of the board, he would have been a perfect person, I thought, to be a barrier between Josh Kroenke and the manager. I think there has to be somebody on the footballing side in between Arteta and Kroenke because Arteta, in the end of the day, is going to always do – I think he's going to do what's best for – I mean, he's going to do what's best for the club, but he there's always an, int there's always an opportunity for him – to get in the Cronkies ear for the benefit of himself. And I'm not saying that he's doing that, but Raul didn't want David Leary on the board. And I think that that's something that needs to be revisited now that Raul is not here. There has to be somebody in between because I think there's too much power that Arteta wields over, over the Cronkies. Like he has more power than Adu. I think he has more power than Vinay. And that's a little bit um, scary because there's just no checks and balances. So let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. So, um, so the KSC model, 
he so he he made a point that he doesn't think that the Arsenal fan base actually care about or not care, but they're not really in tune with what the Crunkies do from a sporting standpoint in America. And some whoever was with him said they don't care. And that's really the reality is like that's that's really what it is. We don't care. What we care about is Arsenal. But for the sake of this conversation, he is trying to implement a North American the Cronkies North American model to Arsenal. Now, whether or not that's going to be successful, I don't know. You know, I'm not sure if it's going to be successful. But what he said was that um, you said Arsenal, like, is their model is draft and develop. So with the Cronkies, if you're, in, if you're informed and kind of understand what the drafting system is, basically you want to have a young team that you can develop, young manager that you can develop. You see that across the the Cronkies um, sports teams. That's what they do. So there's no surprise that we went with Mikel Arteta. And off the back of that, we have so many young players on our team, a lot of whom coming through our academy. He spoke a lot about the academy, and we're seeing a lot more investment in that space. One of the biggest developments since 2018 has been the academy and the work that Per Murder Soccer is doing. Now, People don't care about that because why do I care about the academy? Because we just need to be buying star players. There is a way to win by developing young players into stars within your own system. There is something about that that is sustainable and it's also successful. As Yo-Yo said, it's the Ajax model. It is proven and it works. Um, in the Premier League, it's a little bit different because once you get into the top four, then you need to start spending money, right? When you get into the top four, you've built your, your foundation with your young players from your academy. You've invested in other young players to develop. You have a young manager developing as well. You get into the top four. Now it's time to push. And that's where we're going to actually know whether or not the Cronkies get it. We, Arsenal Football Club, cannot be Dortmund. We can't. We, we're not Dortmund. Dortmund are okay really with being the second best team in Germany. They ne they're they never going to do what's required to go toe to toe with Bayern Munich, stay in Champions League, stay this second best team, buy young players, develop them, sell them for a lot of money, keep the books clean. That is what Dortmund wants. Arsenal Football Club cannot be that. So what we can take is that beginning, like he said, draft and develop, basically just get young players, develop them, that can get you into the top four. We're seeing that with just the beginning of that with Gabrielle White, Ramsdale, Saka, Emil Smith-Rowe, Martinelli. We are close to that line of top four. But then once we get there, are they going to spend the money to help us win the title? That is when we will know. We'll also know if they're good owners, if, they, if we don't meet our targets, if they sack Mikel Arteta. Then we'll know. Are there good signs? Absolutely. I see things that I feel like could be good steps in, towards that sustainability, that sustainability of sustainability of success that we weren't really seeing before. We were trying to buy older players to kind of just piecemeal things together to try to get into top four. That was never going to be sustainable. But what is, is bringing players to your academy, developing them, having a, a plan you know, making sure that we don't derail the plan by bringing in David Louises and Williams and stuff like that. But I'm still a little bit like we need to wait and see. Now, there have been people that have cited what Stan Kroenke did for the Rams in order to get them to the Super Bowl. They won, obviously, which was bring in star players at the very end of their rebuild. So they went with Sean McVay. If you guys don't know, Sean McVay is a young, innovative football coach for the Rams and they built a strong young squad. But then when they got to the point where they wanted to get into the Super Bowl and win it, they brought in Odell Beckham Jr. and some other really good players and boom, they win the title. They win the Super Bowl. Will they do that with Arsenal? I don't know. That is the next kind of like step to see, but um, we're still even like probably a couple steps away from that because they need to invest this summer. They need to invest in bigger players. And then they will have to invest again in order for us to 
try to really compete with with City and Liverpool and Chelsea. So I'm not sure if this American model is going to work. But what I do think is that at the ground floor, at the foundational level, it does make sense in terms of sustainability. If we can continue to bring young players up and have almost like a conveyor belt of young talent coming through Arsenal, I think we will always be in and around the top four. And then, you know, the, the other players have to come in. So I thought that that was interesting, him talking about the draft and develop, the draft and develop that they have in North America is kind of our version of academies and bringing up the Sackas and the Emil Smith Bros and the Martinelli's and, and these guys, and also pairing them with the Whites and the Gabrielles and stuff to get us to that next level. So I kind of, I do like that. I can't lie. Like I, I'm more into using the academy and bringing in young players and developing versus buying a bunch of stars and just trying to make it work and then it falling apart you know and then second the manager and then doing it all again because i don't think that that's sustainable under our ownership we have american owners we don't have a shake and we don't have abramovich and we have to be real about that and he says that the goals are to be higher you know the goals are not even though he he mentioned that we're fifth sixth in the league um right now right now we're like sixth place or whatever that the goal is to be higher um I'm believing your words, but I need to see the actions behind that. And that's kind of where I am with, with Josh Kroenke. I'm willing to give them a chance to change my mind and actually see the changes and not just act like they're doing nothing because they're not doing nothing. Spending $150 million this summer um, is not nothing. Buying out a bombing's contract and sending him to Barcelona is not nothing. Um, these are big steps to get us going in the right direction. But again, in terms of the goals are to be higher, which is what he said. And we're trying to reach that level again, basically where we were in 2004. I'm believing your words, but I actually have to see the action behind it to really like, you know, and so that's kind of where I'm at. But really, really good insight there from from Josh Kroenke. And the one thing that I will say about him is that He's a lot more likable than Stan. Stan is not very likable. He's he doesn't he doesn't he, he has no oomph because he's he's not somebody that you can relate to. But Josh feels more invested. It feels more invested and he's saying the right things, but we need to see it in action. And we'll only know when we fail and when we succeed whether or not they're they're really equipped to do what's necessary to get Arsenal to the very tippy top, but the, the interview is on here. I will put it in the description. If you guys just give me one second, I'll pull it up. But get in the chat box. Let me know what you guys are thinking because I know that I just don't like having conversations that are just like F the Cronkies and da-da-da. Of course we don't like the Cronkies. Of course. Like I'm not saying that they're great owners and having a conversation that's not just riddled with F the Cronkies doesn't necessarily mean that you think that they're good. But at the same time, like, I'm not going to sit here and act like I have not seen a distinct plan to rebuild the club. You know, that's unfair. That is unfair. All right, let me see. Um, give me just a second, you guys. I'm looking for the... Here it is. Um all right i'm about to put it in the in here i wonder if you can put it there okay i just i just commented the the youtube video i don't know you guys can like copy and paste it and look at it after you guys leave here but it was interesting i mean I'm not too, I'm not 100% convinced, but there you go. Um, Hi, Tech J says it's not Kroenke's fault that Pepe flopped. Um, I think it was a bad signing, you know, so wherever you want to place the blame. I mean, at that point, they were believing Raul, and Raul was obviously doing things to make sure that, I'm not going to say for sure, but we know that there was something wrong with that signing. We know that Unai Emery wanted Zaha and we ended up with Pepe. 
and there was something there. It wasn't a price thing because Pepe ended up costing almost the exact same amount as Zaha. And so I don't think it's the Cronkies' fault that Pepe flopped, but it is the Cronkies' fault that they hired bad people. You know, that is their fault. Um, Saturdays equals equals youth it says I'm thinking Newcastle are going to spend a billion over the next 10 years Arsenal may find it extremely tough to crack top four yeah I mean when you have teams like Newcastle who are going to have the type of wealth that the American ownerships don't don't have it is going to be difficult but um we just have to see when it happens um the truth says free says Levy and Kroenke want that list um not trophy um Tell me, tell me this. I'll tell you this. Says, um, still awaiting Dan Gotti to buy the club. Um, I think a lot of people act like they want to buy Arsenal until just so that they can bring awareness, like to whatever they're doing. Um, but also, we know the Cronkies are not interested in selling at all. You know, so when it's not up for sale, there's nothing you really can do. You unless you're going to go way over the price. You know of the of the club to buy it and no smart businessman is going to do that like nobody is going to do that um poly nation says that plan is going to take another five years of pain and suffering um i mean hey if that's what you think i'm i'm not necessarily feeling like it's going to take that long i mean in order for us to win the the title of course like because i don't see who wins the title beyond Man City for the next couple of years. As long as Pep is here, it's going to be pretty much like difficult. But in order to get top four, that's not going to take five years. That could probably take, it could either be this season or next. So I'm not sure if that's really like um, a fair estimate of time on this when we're sitting in like sixth place right now, really fighting for top four this time around. And they will invest in the summer and we will be closer next year. So I'm not sure if five years, I mean, if you're saying five years until we win a title, I don't know who wins the title beyond Man City unless it, unless until Newcastle start like the chokehold that Man City has on the league because they have the perfect manager with the perfect ownership, with the perfect structure, and they're just not getting anything wrong. You know, it's all hits like and no, no misses, you know, with them. So I don't know, but to, for us to get into top four, I think I don't think it's going to take that long. Um, let's see. Right, Rye Dog says agreed. You can't just bank on Hayland, and I don't think that that's what they're doing. I think I get that we didn't get him, but they were willing to spend sixty to eighty million on Dusan Vlahovic in this past window. So I'm not sure that I believe that they're not that they were just going to bank on Hale end. They need, we needed a, a factory reset on this group. Like we really did. And as much as we needed a midfielder, we needed a midfielder, a right back center back, a goalkeeper. We needed a whole new team. And so we went with the young reset and now we still need to do more. And I think that they are going to do more. So I don't think they're banking on Hale and they obviously will spend money on, on players that are not within our Academy or not within our system now. And they've shown that they want to spend big on the right player. So, and, and let's, let's be real. If Dusan Vlahovic would have been interested in coming to Arsenal, he would have been the right player. Like, let's keep it real. He would have elevated us. Um, so yeah, but talk is cheap, you guys. So we, I mean, Let's just not like, that's my thing. It's like, you can, it's with any relationship. Like you may not trust somebody fully, but like when they're making the right steps, like you kind of have to acknowledge them, even though in the back of your mind, you're like, okay, well, I still need to see more. And that's kind of them rebuilding that relationship is going to take time, but I'm not going to sit here and act like they're not trying to make changes. Um, so there you go. Let's see. Okay. Um, Hi, Tech J says the only reason people take Spurs seriously is because of what Levy has done. Um, sure. Um, Ify says Locatelli Vlahovic refused to join Arsenal. I see a lot of players decline Arsenal in the future. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I don't know, you guys. I mean, Locatelli, are you really upset that we didn't get him? Like, 
you know, I'm not sure that I'm really like upset that we didn't get him. Vlahovic, he always wanted to go to Juventus. So, you know, I don't, just because one player declines you doesn't mean that you can't bring in a player that improves you. I remember this past summer when everybody felt like Buendia rejected us. He's done absolutely nothing at Aston Villa and we got Odegaard and we're happy. So we're in a position now where, of course, we're not going to be able to get our top, top targets. So getting rejected is in the in the game. Like there are better teams than us that are getting rejected by players as well. So I don't really think this players declining us means that nobody's going to come to Arsenal. I think that that's kind of recent like that's and it's kind of wrapped up in being disappointed in the transfer window and feeling like all is lost but getting rejected is a part of the game most clubs keep it behind closed doors how many times they get rejected you'll see something come out from journalists that say something like we were never interested in that player yeah they got rejected so Everybody gets declined. We're not in a position where we can get Mbappes and Hollands and be the number one on the list, but we can still attract good players that are going to improve us. And so I just feel like, you know, like I get what you're trying to say, but like, I don't think it's that gloomy as you're making it seem. Um, so, yeah. Exactly. So the last thing that I kind of wanted to touch on was just him kind of talking about the Super League. And I think that, okay, so since 2018, they have been trying to move forward, but the Super League really damaged the relationship or any sort of like hope. Like, I'm not going to say hope. What I want to, what do I want to say? If you were starting to think that the Cronkies aren't as bad as you thought, the Super League puts you right back into being like, oh, I don't trust them, right? Because this is all about trust. Do we trust that they're going to do the right thing? And the Super League decision was a big one. But what I found interesting is that, you know, he said it happened in a 48-hour period or whatever. Whether that's true or not, I don't really care. But he said that the question that they asked themselves is, would they rather there be a Super League with or without Arsenal? And which would be more difficult to explain to the fan base? And I thought to myself, I'm like, if I'm sitting in a, in a, in a boardroom and I have like 24 hours to make a decision, a huge decision on being in the Super League or outside of it, and I'm asking myself, what would be the more difficult thing to explain to the fan base? Arsenal not in the Super League? Remember, at this point, it's going forward, right? Arsenal in the Super League or Arsenal outside of the Super League? I agree with him. I honestly think that if if they had went forward with the Super League and we knew it was happening now and they replaced us with Newcastle, we would be livid. We would be livid. The reason why people were so upset was because you had to be upset about the Super League. But I always maintain that although I don't like the idea of a Super League because of what it does to the lower leagues and it it takes away the co the competitiveness in actual sport and makes it more of entertainment and all of that kind of stuff. I already went through that. But if you ask me straight up, would I prefer Arsenal to be in it or not in it? I want, I would prefer Arsenal to be in it because that kind of keeps us in, in a situation where we're at the top, like we're at the, the main table and we're not out here struggling in some other league where you can't even get access to the top league, even if you're good. You know, so I agreed with that. I did. And if you only had 48 hours to really think about this and make a decision, then your decision probably would be the same if you're honest with yourself. The Super League, the idea of it was terrible for the game. It absolutely was. But I understood what he was saying. But because of the overall um, negativity about the European Super League and the clubs that were involved in it and how sinister it felt. I understand why the, a lot of people in the fan base took that as like a gut punch and why maybe the couple of steps forward that Josh and the Cronkies had made, they went a couple of steps back because of just that one huge but decision made in 48 hours, as he said. Um, let's see. 
Polymation says they all colluded against the interest of football. I'm not buying that excuse. It's not a, it's not an excuse though. I mean, it wasn't an excuse. Like he literally said what his, what his thought process was like, not everything is an excuse just because you explain your thought process. That's not an excuse. Like, cause he also apologized and, and was like, it was the wrong decision to make that he, he admitted that the super league was a bad idea and, and all of that. But understanding where he was in that boardroom with a couple of hours to make a decision and the decision was Arsenal in or out of the Super League. I understand why he made that decision and I probably would have made the same one because if it had went forward, we would have wanted to be in it. We would have. Like a lot of Arsenal fans, if they replaced us with Newcastle, let's let's keep it 100. So it's not an excuse. It's an understanding of where he was at that in that position. The Super League was bad. Do I think his decision was wrong? He would have had a hard time explaining that to me, why Arsenal wasn't in it, if we had had an invitation. Is that I'm telling you, the only reason why the Evertons and the Villas and the Brightons and all of them were mad is because they didn't have an invitation. That's all it was. Um, Archangel says, KSC is only in it to milk the club and the fans to finance their U.S. teams. Well, they can't take money out of Arsenal and put it into their they're U.S. teams. That's not how it works. The Cronkies care nothing for us. We'll never truly be competitive on, under them. We must force them out. Archangel, you let us know how we're going to force them out. Don one says, recruitment, recruitment, recruitment. We need to do our homework and bring in the right players. I agree. Um, Yo-Yo says, Arsenal's last and next seat at the Super League is due to generations of decades of work that preceded KSC. That's what bothers me the most as a Gooner. Arsenal are great in spite of them, not because. That is very true. That before, and that that's the thing. It's like, it's not even just what Arsene Wenger did. Like, Arsenal were a big club before Arsene Wenger came. If nobody knew that. So I think that that makes a lot of sense. You know, that we are we have been successful despite them and the other other partial owners that have been here and all that kind of stuff. So I get that point and that, that makes a lot of sense. And this is what I say about being specific about what you're actually upset about saying things like we never spend money that ain't it. But yo-yo's point about us being a very, like Arsenal being very successful and them, the seat that they had at the super league having nothing to do with them. That is valid. That is very valid. Um, very good point. Um, Pap says, just a Super League is the same thing as MLS, no relegation, money, security. Of course, like that's what they wanted. And that's what most of these owners really want. They want to be able to have a closed league where there's no relegation and it just becomes entertainment. Because once you create something of a McDonald's-esque version of sport, it becomes entertainment and that is a never ending money like circulating. It's like almost having like an ATM at your house where you could just like boop, more money, more twenties, more hundreds, more, more thousands, you know? So it's, they could create something like the NFL, you know, create something like the NBA and the NBA and the NFL, those teams make so much money despite whether they're good or not. You know, of course you want to, then you can be creative at certain times and try to push your team into the finals and all that kind of stuff. But once you McDonald's sport, it becomes entertainment and entertainment is a lot more profitable to owners than sport. If that makes sense, because sport has the, you have the ability to lose, but they don't want that. And it's not just the American owners, Real Madrid, Juventus, all these other teams, they're not owned by Americans. That is the, any owner would say, I'd rather have that because it, it protects them. And like you said, their money security. So of course the super league was basically going to be an MLS and um, it would not have been as fun to watch. That's for sure. Cause the jeopardy is what really makes um, football special for me. Um, you know, um, let's see. Don one says, I don't believe him just, he wanted that. Um, SL, his father was pushing for it. Yeah, well, Chelsea, Man City, Man United, Liverpool, um, Spurs, Juventus, Atletico Madrid, Real Madrid, Barcelona, they all push for it. You know, it wasn't just us. Like, that's the thing. It's like, 
if you know all of the biggest teams are going to want to be in this thing, right? Being out of it in like in, in the moment, you may think like you wanted Josh to say and stand to say, no, we stand up against it. But I guarantee if we were in another league where we could never touch the Super League and they replaced us with Newcastle, you would feel differently about our decision not to be in it because it closes you away from being a big club. Arsenal, if they had been outside of the Super League, we would never be a big club again. And that's what we all want. That's what we're talking about, right? So I get not believing him and that that's fine, but he's not trying to make you believe anything. He's literally saying that he made the decision to get put because like, of course, financially it's better, but Arsenal fans need to keep it 100. Like if we were not in it, you would be salty. And so, yeah, like, I, I get not believing him and all that kind of stuff, but when he's when he put it made it that simple to me, I understand why he made that decision. Financially, it's the best decision, and um, for the football club because whoever was outside of it was never going to reach the pinnacle again. Yeah, you can't really explain that to our Arsenal fan base that will never be a big club again, ever. It's it's just real. Um, let's see. High Tech J says you only complain about parties you're not invited to. Um, let's see. Um, happily egg says a non-relegation league turns football into WWE, just a form of entertainment. There has no sense of, yeah, no sense of jeopardy. Exactly. Um, so when he taught, when he talked about that, I was like, okay. Then like, we know what it is. You guys, we understand that most owners, if they have the opportunity to get themselves into a closed league, change the sport into entertainment and have an ever like, an ever like ever flowing amount of cash coming into your club all the time. They're always going to choose that always the blowback from that has been catastrophic, especially like, you know, in our own fan base, whatever, like that's what I'm really looking at. And so his, his task to try to build that bridge between him and the Arsenal fan base is going to take a long time. And it's not only going to come with, you know, short-term success, but it's going to be long-term success, sustainable success. And the foundation that they are trying to build now, I believe can bring us that. But will it be able to get us to the tippy top? I'm not sure. And I, like, again, until we're in the circumstance where, like, Arteta has missed out on top six and it's time to move on from him, if they don't sack him, you failed, you know? If we get into the top four this season, you know, and we don't spend big, sorry, in the summer, the way that we should, because we have Champions League football, you're done. Like, you know what I mean? So we'll only really know whether or not he's telling the truth and maybe really means it. And of course, everything that he does is based on financially him getting the most out of his investment. So let's get the fairy tale Disney plus thing out of our head that he's going to do it because he loves Arsenal. It's not that it's, it's not that, but if he wants Arsenal to be successful and for the fans to love the club, because if the fans don't love the club or they start to have that level of apathy, it is going to hurt the bottom line for Josh Kroenke. So to keep Arsenal fans happy, we have to be competitive. And in order for us to be competitive, they need to build a plan that gives us long term sustainable success and that's really what this is coming from i am under no illusions that he actually is like wanting to like love arsenal like you know um the truth that's free thank you so much for your super chat says dealing with negative internet trolls to support you is brutal but you're a legend so it's worth it keep up the great work thank you so much um i hope nobody is like okay so if we're in the chat box let's just be nice to each other like and just be chill Let's just relax. Like we're having a good time. No need to be like negative or anything like that. But like, if you're getting any abuse, I'm sorry about that. I hope you're not. And in terms of the trolls that abuse me, like it is what it is. Like, you know, cause I'm like not going anywhere. Um, Pap says question, Jess, do you think would a super league benefit the lower leagues in England? Um, 
No, I don't think so. So I think one of the, the big things about the Super League was that it was going to like, so the, the big clubs were like, oh, well, we are going to give money to the lower leagues and all that kind of stuff. And some sort of like, hey, we're going to F you over, but like, we'll give you like a check, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and it's like a certain percentage was going to go down to the lower leagues and all that kind of stuff. So I don't think it would benefit it. Um, I think the Super League teams are going to try to do something in order to kind of it's almost like um, when you do something wrong and then you pay somebody off not to like come after you. It was kind of like one of those types of things. That's what it felt like. Um, but I don't think it 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 benefits the lower leagues. And I think that like any any circumstance where there's going to be a closed league that other teams can't be a part of and it's going to take the majority because the whole thing is like. Like. You, once you take those big teams out of those those leagues, especially when we talk about the not even the EPL, we're talking about like let's let's look at Serie A and, and La Liga. You take Barcelona and Real Madrid out of that league, ain't nobody watching that. They like even once Cristiano Ronaldo and Messi left La Liga, they immediately knew that Real Madrid and Barcelona needed to go after Mbappe and Holland because they have no stars in that league anymore. Like I hate to be like, you know, but they didn't. So, like. When you take those teams out of those leagues, you just, you ruin it, you know? And so it's not even just like the lower leagues. It's like even the league, just like the top league is going to be done. And then so every league underneath that is going to feel that um, this that disparity. So I think that it was going to be devastating for the lower leagues in every country um, on the continent. And so like, it it was not going to benefit the lower leagues. Let's keep it real. Even if they try to slide them a little check, it wasn't going to. And that was a big pushback of, because grassroots and lower leagues and all that kind of stuff is a big part of the, the footballing experience in England. And so you take that away. Um, but that's not really what Josh and them were thinking about. Like, you know, we know that um, the trickle down is terrible. Um, yeah, but yeah, they they did say that they would have trickle down money for the table and all that kind of stuff. But I still have reservations on whether or not that would have been enough. Um, you know, let's see, let's see. Yeah, so that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today. I have to be honest, like. Wait, what's that? Oh, I just saw a comment and I was like, wait, what? Yeah. So in the end of the day, like we will only know whether or not this works over time and we'll only really know when we win and when we lose, whether or not the Cronkies or Josh Cronky in particular is going to do the right thing by Arsenal Football Club. I have reservations about the structure. I definitely think there needs to be somebody in between Josh Cronky and Arteta as Yo-Yo put and, and, and I was talking about as well, but the foundation that we're building is the type of foundation that gives you sustainable success. Is it going to take you to the tippy top? Probably not. You are going to have to do a Odell, you know, Beckham Jr. type signings to get you to the tippy top, you know, and that's what they've done for the Rams. But we know that the love for Arsenal is not the same. So will they stop spending once they get back into Champions League and they kind of have that money coming in? I don't know. The jury is still out, but I do like us putting more emphasis on our academy, kind of building from the ground up, bringing in young players that can be developed. And um, yeah, so it's kind of like a 50-50 thing for me right now. Um, do they deserve a clean slate since now they have 100? Because they, they put a lot of emphasis on that. We are full owners since, since you know 2018. And since 2018, we bought Guendouzi, Torreira, Socrates, Ceballos, Martinelli, uh, David Luiz, Tierney, Pepe, Willian, Gabriel, Thomas Party, Odegaard, Tommy Asu, Ben White, Ramsdale, um, Sambi, Tavares, and there's probably a couple other ones that I'm I'm missing, but that is a lot of investments in 2018. It just hasn't been that great, you know. So. Um, we'll definitely see what, what's going on there. Um, but yeah, we'll see. Let's see what you guys are saying before I get out of here. I do have to run soon. Um, I wanted to make sure I came on and talked about this interview because I thought it was interesting and it sparked so much debate because 
there's some people that just hate the Cronkies, but I don't think they really are grasping the fact that they're literally going to be our owners. So I think it's important to pay attention to what they're actually doing um, because they are doing things that could make us more successful than what we were before. But does that mean that they're great owners? I'm not sure, you know? Um, yeah, tell me this. I'll tell you this. Is technically we never side to BIOS. Well, I added that in there because you do have to pay for loans, don't you? So I put BIOS in there. I put Odegaard as a loan as well. That ended up being, you know, so I added that in there. If you want to take some BIOS out, that's fine. Still a lot of investment there. Um, Polymation says we have tried this model before. It doesn't work under the current football climate. Again, not trying to be negative. This football model does work if you're willing to once you build this, the, the foundation to go out and get your Allison and go out and get your Virgil van Dijk, that's the difference. You can't just rely upon the foundation of young players that will in developing them that can get you into top four, but we know what that next level is. You have to buy those star players after that, that can, you know, get things over the line and, and take you into that next echelon of team. And so I get what you're saying, but, and that's, I mean, that's what he said. And so we have to hold him accountable for that. He said that it's draft and develop and then more after that. And so more looks like bringing in star players after you build that foundation to finish the project off and actually compete for titles. So the model does work though. It's It gives you long term sustainability. And that is something that Arsenal Football Club need. We don't have it. We've really kind of like over the last five years, over the last 10 years, just really kind of had to buy a little player here, try to piecemeal it together here, try to buy one player to try to get us into top four here, buy an old guy here, uh, re-sign him to a big contract there, you know, bring in a William. That hasn't worked. But what we've done by getting rid of the guys on big contracts and bringing in young players that can be developed and grow together, that can work, but we need the other pieces as well. Um, you guys, make sure you like the video. You know, Yo-Yo says, KSC aren't victims. They deserve nothing. Gooners have long had the most expensive season tickets in Europe. Let's talk more results. Yeah, and they do definitely have to show. It has to show out on the pitch. You know, it has to has to make sense. Exactly. So, Again, the end of the story is we have to wait and see, you know, do they deserve a clean slate? No, I think in this circumstance, you're guilty until you're proven innocent, right? So I recognize that Josh is new. I recognize that Josh is trying to do good things. I recognize that they've been 100% owners since 2018, but I need to see more before I start saying that they're good owners. And I don't, I think we need to be kind of on them until they show that, um, so yeah, hold your horses. Let's not like just switch up and say KSC is the shit now. Um, but I am seeing decent signs. Um, yeah, I have to go. I have to run. Obviously there's football on today, so we'll see what happens with that. Come back tomorrow and talk about some of the transferring news type of stuff. And um, also who's available for the match um, match in the weekend. I know Tamiyasu is, is, is coming back and that's good. And there were some other things you guys want to talk about. I put out something on Twitter and asked you guys what you wanted to talk about. You want to talk about the red cars, referees, um, uh, signings and all that kind of stuff. So we will talk about that, but I did want to make sure that we, um, we talked about this first. Um, I will see you guys in the next one. Like the video, subscribe to the channel and yeah, enjoy the rest of your day.